Tammy Wyke's first hermit crab came into her life in seventh grade, and she has had hermit crabs ever since for the past 43 years. Using what she learned from her crabs over the years, in April 2005 she opened the Crabbage Patch at her local flea market. Tammy's philosophy was to keep things simple, provide accurate information, and try to mimic what hermit crabs would find in the wild. Some of her early unique products and practices are now commonly found throughout the hermit crab industry. The discovery that hermit crabs like worm castings, developing a moist sand substrate mix for successful molts, and selling shells by opening size, to name just a few. From there, she opened a local retail shop, changed the name to the Hermit Crab Patch, and created an online store, which she currently runs with the help of her husband, Kirk. Tammy says she feels very fortunate to be able to have a business that is also her passion for the last 15 years. Please welcome Tammy Wyke. In order to grow, a hermit crab must shed its hard outer covering called an exoskeleton. This process is known as ecdysis, or molting, and happens throughout its entire life. My introduction to molting came as an unexpected surprise back in 1995. My husband Kirk and I were sitting in our backyard in South Florida one day. My Jumbo, which I had named the Professor, was out with us exploring the backyard. As we were talking, I glanced over to check on him and saw that he was over near one of the trees and starting to dig in the ground. We decided to let him be and keep an eye on what he was doing. As the time progressed, we both watched in fascination as he continued to dig and eventually cover himself up completely. At this point, I wasn't quite sure what to do. I didn't know why he would bury, but trusted his instinct to do so. Worried that I would lose him when he resurfaced in a couple of days, I put a laundry basket upside down over the area where he had buried, and then placed a heavy cinder block on top to keep it in place. I imagine you all know what happened next. Many times a day, day after day after day, I would go out and check on him, but nothing. I was getting really worried since he didn't have food or water, and I was beginning to lose hope, but for some reason still resisted the urge to try and dig him up. A couple of days turned into a couple of months, but I would still check on him regularly. Then it happened. One day during month three, I saw a small hole appear near where he had buried. I pulled off the laundry basket, looked closer, and I could actually see the professor moving just below the surface. There were pieces of his large claw, leg tips, and a few other parts of his exoskeleton that were in with him. His exoskeleton was shiny deep brown, and he had needle sharp leg tips and a lot of shiny blonde fur. He had molted. This was a light bulb moment for me. Up until now, I had been keeping him in a tank with a few inches of dry beach sand, and he wouldn't have been able to bury Thanks to the professor, I began my search to learn more about the process of molting. I started searching for molting information, and the first book I came across was by Dorothy Bliss, called Shrimps, Lobsters, and Crabs, Their Fascinating Life Story. Her book explained the molting process and so much more. I also had access to the University of Miami's Rosenstiel Library, where I found the book The Biology of Crabs. It contained a section written by G.F. Warner on crab growth and molting that I was able to take notes from. Neither of these books address molting and land hermit crabs specifically, but they gave me a general understanding of the molting process. As a result of this information, and what the professor had taught me, Kirk decided to build my first outdoor cage. The earth was the bottom of the cage, so our crabs were free to bury whenever they wanted to. 
I also started giving my crabs a bowl of salt water made with instant ocean, in addition to the fresh water I had been giving them all along. In The Biology of the Land Crabs, another great book that I had found, Peter Greenaway explained how hermit crabs store water in the back of their shells and regulate it to the proper salinity they need by mixing fresh and salt water. With my new outdoor cage, I had plenty of space for more hermit crabs, and my colony grew. All of my crabs were now able to bury and molt successfully. When I started my hermit crab business 10 years later, one of the first products we developed was our pre-mixed sand substrate. We stressed to our customers that they needed to provide their hermit crabs with deep, moist sand substrate in order for the crabs to successfully molt in captivity. While gathering information to do this presentation, I spent many hours on Google Scholar to see what information I could find. I wasn't able to find any molt staging studies on land hermit crabs or the related coconut crab, which was surprising and disappointing. The information I found involved studies on blue crabs, lobsters, crayfish, and other crustaceans, many of which have importance as food sources in commercial industry. So I've had to extrapolate from studies on other crustaceans due to the lack of information available on hermit crab molting. For those of you not familiar with molting, Warwick Fletcher gives us a general overview of the molting process in the coconut crab, a close relative of the land hermit crab. He writes, Coconut crabs have a special behavioral adaptation for molting in the terrestrial environment, which they often accomplish in a subterranean burrow. Before the crab molts, its abdomen becomes greatly enlarged due to a rapid accumulation of fluid. The crabs first dig a burrow in soft earth areas, away from their usual rocky habitats. The tunnels of adult crabs may extend for about one meter and to a depth of half a meter. As the crab digs, it replaces the earth behind it so that only a fan of disturbed soil is left to indicate the position of the entrance. The crab molts in a chamber which is roughly circular and at least twice the crab's volume. Minerals are resorbed from the old exoskeleton which ultimately splits at the joint between thorax and abdomen due to an increase in internal hydrostatic pressure. The crab slowly pulls out of the old exoskeleton over a period of one to two hours, revealing the new soft pale blue white exoskeleton. The crab remains immobile for some days while its exoskeleton begins to harden. Subsequently, it consumes the old shell or exuvium which enables minerals such as calcium to be recycled. This appears to contribute to the hardening of the new shell. The time taken to complete the entire process is related to the size of the crab. Larger crabs may take as long as three to four weeks to finish eating the exuvium and for the exoskeleton to harden sufficiently for the crab to emerge. Thus, up to one and a half months may be required to complete the entire molting process in large individuals. I will begin the discussion of the land hermit crab molt cycle with an overview of the four stages of molting. Looking further into each stage, I will focus on what is physically and physiologically happening with the hermit crab. I'll introduce the basic hormones involved in each stage and look at limb regeneration in a crab that has lost a leg or claw. As mentioned, there are four main stages to a hermit crab's molt cycle. Intermolt, premolt, ectysis, and postmolt. These stages are often broken down to specific sub-stages, but for our purposes I will simply refer to them as early, mid, or late. Beginning with intermolt, the hermit crab has completed molting and is above the surface living its life. The hermit crab senses it is time to molt again 
and begins to enter pre-molt. Pre-molt is all about preparing for the upcoming molt, stocking up on food and water, and digging underground. The third stage, ecdysis, is a brief stage where the hermit crab actually sheds its exoskeleton. In stage four, post-molt, the hermit crab hardens up. It eats its old exoskeleton and resurfaces to once again begin inner molt. The integument or exoskeleton, which is the hard outer covering of a hermit crab, is composed of four different layers above the epidermis, which secretes each layer. In this image, depicting a fully developed exoskeleton, the outermost layer is called the epicuticle, and it acts as a protective layer. It is primarily made up of lipids, proteins, and calcium, and doesn't contain chitin. Next is the exocuticle that contains chitin, proteins, and calcium. Together, these two layers comprise the preexuvial layer since they are deposited before a molt. After that comes the endocuticle, which is made up of chitin, proteins, and calcium. Finally, the membranous layer sits below the endocuticle and on top of the epidermis. It consists of chitin, and protein, but it is not calcified. Together these two layers are called the post layer since they are formed after the molt. Pore canals stemming from the epidermis are seen as vertical lines on the right side of the image. They are involved in the deposit of calcium and other minerals needed to harden the exoskeleton after shedding. The hormonal processes involved in molting are very complex. To simplify things, I will give a general overview. Molting is controlled by a neurosecretory center located in the eye stalks called the X organ sinus gland complex. This organ produces and stores a neuropeptide called molt inhibiting hormone, or MIH. When MIH is secreted into the hemolymph of the crab, Similar to our blood, it acts to conversely affect the release of molting hormones. The molting gland is called the Y organ, and it consists of a pair of glands located in the cephalothorax, or head and back region, that produce and secrete into the hemolymph extosteroids, also known as molting hormones, or MH. Molting occurs when molting inhibiting hormones are reduced to a point that allows for maximum flow of molting hormones in the hemolymph. The timing of this decrease in molt inhibiting hormone and increase in molting hormone can be affected by both external environmental conditions and the internal health of a hermit crab. Dorothy Bliss discusses that factors that favor successful molting appear to cause the withholding of the molt inhibiting hormone. She says, these factors are darkness, solitude, warmth, and moisture, the same factors that prevail at the bottom of a crab's burrow. Should environmental factors become unfavorable, should there be light, other crabs nearby, cold or heat, dryness, the molt inhibiting hormone is released into the circulation and proecdysis also known as premolt, is delayed for the period of time that the environment remains unfavorable. Internal health factors may also cause molt inhibiting hormone to remain high and delay molting. When a crab loses a limb, it will need time to generate a new limb bud at the base of the severed limb. If it is malnourished, it will delay molting to allow enough time to uptake the water and nutrition it needs to survive molting. Regardless of the factors that cause the molt inhibiting hormone to remain high, there is a point where the crab can delay molting no longer. From our observations, we have seen crabs at this point attempt a surface molt, usually unsuccessfully, 
withdrawing from the old exoskeleton only partially. Or they might start to become very lethargic, begin dropping limbs and claws, and eventually die. It is critical to a hermit crab's long-term survival that when the molt inhibiting hormone is at its lowest and molting hormone is flowing at its highest, the crab is safely buried and able to complete its molt. Intermolt, which comprises most of the time between molts, is the longest stage in the molt cycle and a hermit crab's life. During this time, the crab is above ground, actively eating, drinking, and living its life. It needs to rebuild its metabolic reserves, such as calcium, lipids, carbohydrate, and proteins that were depleted during its last molt. At the start of intermolt, tissue growth continues until the membranous layer has been secreted and the exoskeleton is considered to be complete and fully calcified. During this phase, any legs or claws that were lost begin regeneration. Regrowth begins as a papilla and then progresses to develop into a small limb bud, which is folded upon itself inside a cuticular sac. The limb bud remains small during intermolt until molting preparation begins in premolt. Molting hormone levels circulating in the hemolymph or blood remain low during intermolt when the crab is not molting or preparing to molt. Molt inhibiting hormone secreted in a pulsatile fashion acts to keep the Y organ that secretes molting hormones in its basal or resting state. The onset of pre-molt begins with preparations for the upcoming molt. At the beginning of this phase, hermit crabs continue to store nutrients and water needed to sustain them during their impending molt. Their enlarged abdomens and protruding fluid-filled abdominal lobes, commonly referred to as molt sacs, are external signs that the time to bury is drawing near. Other signs such as eyes that appear cloudy and declining activity levels may be noticed as well. There are many changes occurring in the exoskeleton at this time. The membranous layer of the exoskeleton is digested by enzymes, causing the separation of the endocuticle from the epidermis, which is known as a polysis. The separation creates a space where the epidermis can now produce the first two layers of the new exoskeleton, which are deposited before the molt. They consist of both the epicuticle and the exocuticle. The epicuticle, which will become the new outer layer of the exoskeleton, is insoluble to protect it from being digested by the active molting fluid, which is produced to break down the old endocuticle layer. Both layers remain flexible until after shedding. Muscle attachment fibers become elongated, anchoring the new epicuticle and exocuticle to the old exoskeleton, allowing basic movements until the exoskeleton has been shed. Calcium, minerals, and other organic components are being withdrawn from the old exoskeleton and reabsorbed. In hermit crabs, this can give a chalky appearance to the exoskeleton and is another visual cue in early pre-molt that the time to molt is drawing near. In preparation for the upcoming molt, molting hormone levels begin to increase in early pre-molt as the Y organ sensitivity to molt inhibiting hormone decreases. At this time, the Y organ becomes activated due to the fall in molt inhibiting hormone levels leading to changes occurring in preparation for the upcoming molt. During mid-premolt, as levels of molting hormones in the hemolymph continue to rise and remain at their highest levels, the Y organ enters the committed state, 
The hermit crab must molt due to the very high levels of molting hormones and the insensitivity of the Y organ to molt inhibiting hormones. Finally, in late pre-molt, after reaching a peak in molting hormone levels, there is a sudden fall in hemolymph levels of molting hormone, leading the Y organ to enter the repressed state, which remains throughout ecdysis. During this phase, limb buds grow rapidly and become fully developed. However, they still remain folded and fully encased in their sac of cuticle, waiting to unfold at ecdysis. Another interesting occurrence near the end of premolt is atrophy of the large claw muscle. This is necessary to ensure that it is able to be withdrawn through its very narrow joint when molting occurs. Premolt ends when resorption of the old exoskeleton is complete. Ecdysis, which is the actual shedding of the old exoskeleton, is the shortest phase in the molt cycle. At the beginning of ecdysis, water previously stored in the crab's hemolymph which is similar to our blood, along with the water stored in the molt sacs, is used to create hydrostatic pressure. As the crab swells, the brittle exoskeleton is split along predetermined lines. The hermit crab's abdomen remains in its shell with the body of the crab extending outward while it sheds. Muscular movements enable the crab to pull out of the old exoskeleton, and stored fluids expand the soft, new exoskeleton after this occurs. Limb buds that were previously folded in their protective sac unfold and begin to expand as well. Once the crab is fully free of its old exoskeleton, it retracts back into its shell. The crab uses the shell to help mold the new soft exoskeleton during calcification, which is the hardening of the new exoskeleton. This photo shows an exoskeleton that has been shed completely intact. You can see the blotchy areas on his legs and claws where calcium and mineral resorption has occurred prior to shedding. I've turned the exoskeleton around in this photo so that you are looking into the cephalothorax, which is the head and back. You can see the cuticle covering the gills has been shed, along with portions of the digestive system that are lined with cuticle. The visible crack on a segment of the large claw called the meris allows the large claw to be more easily withdrawn. Finally, you can see the telson and uropods located at the end of the abdomen, which are used by the crab to hold on to its shell. Here is a good picture of a freshly molted crab pulled back into its shell. Notice the light color of the new exoskeleton and how the crab is using the shell to help shape its soft body. The 
the start of post-molt, the freshly molted hermit crab is soft, pale, and vulnerable. Its new exoskeleton only consists of the two layers that had been formed before ecdysis. Now the third layer, called the endocuticle forms, also muscle and tissue inside of the large claw, is restored. The soft exoskeleton begins to harden up through a process called sclerotization, also referred to as tanning, and the crab's color becomes darker. Now the crab is able to begin eating its shed exoskeleton for the calcium and other minerals that it contains. Calcification occurs and the new membranous layer forms to complete the new exoskeleton. Finally, the crab resurfaces and the molt cycle is complete. Once the molt has been completed, the Y organ increases its sensitivity to molt inhibiting hormone in post-molt and rapidly returns to its basal or resting state. A new limb that was regenerated is a smaller version of what had been lost, and its color may be different than normal. It may take two or three more molts for it to grow to normal size. For years, I kept a molting diary where I documented all of my pet crab's molts. As my crab population grew, I was able to see trends develop that appeared to vary based on crab size. For instance, small crabs that are actively growing and molting more frequently tend not to remain buried as long as older, larger crabs. Following is a basic timeline regarding size, molting length, and frequency that I took from the information that I gathered. This is a guideline and not engraved in stone. Tiny crabs with shells that are about the size of a dime will bury for about two weeks, many times per year. Small crabs about the size of a quarter will bury up to a month, three to four times per year. Medium crabs, about the size of a golf ball will bury for one to two months, one to two times per year. Large crabs about the size of a tennis ball will bury for two to three months, one time per year. Jumbo crabs wearing shells about the size of a baseball or larger will bury for three months every year or so. Using these observations, I put together this chart that relates crab size, molt frequency, and recommended minimum safe substrate depth. A copy of this chart can be found on our premix substrate product page. Personally, I believe that it is extremely important to set your tank up with a uniform substrate that is deep enough for your largest crab making the substrate a uniform depth across the bottom of the tank maximizes the area available for molting and minimizes the chance that a molting crab will be disturbed by one of the other crabs. A good rule of thumb is to make your substrate three to four times as deep as your largest crab shell is tall. The substrate should also be moist enough to pack well. Hermit crabs tend to bury deep for better protection and will create an underground burrow, about twice their size, in which to molt. Using this rule will ensure that they are able to stay protected when they are most vulnerable. I don't recommend using isolation tanks for molting, since it isn't always possible to know exactly when your crabs are ready to molt. By using deep, uniform substrate in your tank, you are eliminating the guesswork and your tank will be ready when each crab decides to molt. There are times when you may have a crab that is physically unable to bury to molt. Some examples are a crab that has lost multiple limbs, a crab that has resurfaced but is too weak to rebury, or if you need to relocate your crab habitat during a move. In situations such as these, I've had success using a molting bin to get the crab through its molt. These are the supplies you will need to create a molting bin. 
First, a dark colored file box or bin with a snap-on lid. Second, enough moist sand substrate mixture to fill the bin almost to the top. Third, a plastic flower pot saucer that fits into the bin leaving an inch or two between the saucer and the bin wall. The procedure I use for creating the molting bin is as follows. First, using the moist substrate, fill the bin almost to the top and pack it firmly. Second, in the center of the bin, you will want to dig a hole deep enough that your crab cannot easily climb out of, but not all the way to the bottom of the bin. The hole should be wide enough that your crab has room to move without touching the sides, about two to three times the width of its shell. Third, before putting the crab into the hole, I always place the crab in the food dish and each water dish one last time, allowing it time to eat and drink if needed. And fourth, when ready, set the crab into the hole you made and cover it with the flower pot saucer using it upside down. You want to make sure that the saucer completely covers the opening and is well supported by the surrounding sand before snapping on the bin lid. While in the bin, you should briefly check on your crab periodically to see if it has molted. Sometimes a crab may bury further into the side of the hole, but as long as the lid has remained secure, you don't need to worry that your crab has escaped. After the crab has molted and eaten most of the exoskeleton and its color is close to normal, you can return it to the crab attack. If it doesn't feel quite ready to face the other crabs, it may bury for a short period of time. I also remove any leftover exoskeleton from the bin and crush it for all of the crabs to eat. Originally I had to disturb this crab from her molt due to an upcoming renovation project. When I gently dug down to find her, she had already been buried for 45 days. She was about two feet down near the bottom of our large indoor cage. When I pulled her out of the substrate, her exoskeleton was blotchy from calcium and mineral resorption, but she hadn't molted yet. This picture was taken during her third week in the molting bin. You can see she's had a successful molt, but still has quite a bit of exoskeleton left to eat, and her color is fairly light. It was too early to remove her from the bin. Using a molting bin can be a real lifesaver. I've used this technique successfully many times over the years and have helped my customers do the same. In conclusion, molting is a critical process necessary for growth and survival in hermit crabs. It involves a complex, well-coordinated interplay of numerous neuropeptide and steroid hormones, physiological changes, and environmental influences. When all goes as intended, a successful molt occurs. A working knowledge of the molt cycle is important for hermit crab owners so that they know what to expect and what to provide so that their pet hermit crabs survive during this vulnerable time and thrive long term. My approach to caring for hermit crabs has always been to keep things simple and to simulate what crabs would have access to in the wild. For successful molting, you will want to provide a tank that is large enough that your crabs don't feel overcrowded. Fewer crabs kept together is safer than having too many. Fill the tank uniformly with moist substrate to a depth that accommodates safe molting of your largest crab. Provide both a freshwater and saltwater bowl so that your crabs can create whatever salinity water they require for molting, drinking, and carrying as shell water. Provide a variety of foods rich in fats, proteins, carbohydrates, calcium, and phytochemicals needed to sustain them when they molt. Finally, trust that when given what they need, your hermit crabs will do as nature intended and of course resist the temptation to disturb your crabs once they have buried. These simple steps will allow your hermit crabs the freedom to molt whenever they are ready, 
allowing you to enjoy your pets for many years to come.